I appreciate the uh, presence of everyone for the class. We're currently in the study of uh, logic and the Bible. And uh, we'll continue on from where we uh, uh, left off last week. <clears throat> we were studying the methods for determining the validity or uh, invalidity of syllogisms. And anyway, we'll continue that and we'll get into some other uh, areas too. <clears throat> and what I will do tonight is I will go back over what we've already done and have some exercises in those things that we've done and just uh, kind of walk you through them so we get a better idea of, of uh, what we've learned. <clears throat> Before we start, though, let's have a word of prayer. Would you bow in, please? Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time that we can study Thy Word and study the means by which we can determine the intent of the words that You have set forth in Your Holy Writ. And we're grateful for those who have an interest in the uh, Gospels and are trying to conduct themselves in accordance with their, uh, their Gospels and who have that hope of heaven and is looking forward to their long home. So we pray that you'll bless our study and that we'll derive the utmost benefit from the things that we learn in our own continued studies. We know that we are learning about the Christ and what he did for us, and we're grateful for that, and we're blessed by it. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm uh, sharing a screen. I, uh, I hope you can see it. And uh, we talked about in, in trying to determine the uh, validity or the alternative is the invalidity of a syllogism. We talked about the counter ex examples. When you're not sure about the validity, you can uh, insert different uh, examples or different terms and what have you and see whether or not the uh, form of the uh, syllogism still makes sense when you substitute uh, terms or examples there. But sometimes when the syllogism is valid, it's kind of hard to substitute something when it's already a valid syllogism. So another method uh, for testing the validity of syllogism is uh, needed and that involves the use of rules. You, of course you'd probably guess that we're gonna have some sort of rules somewhere along the, the way. And we've been talking about rules all along, so why not some more rules? <clears throat> Hello, Ken. Yes. Uh you're not you're not actually sharing the screen. I think you're thinking of sharing. I got a zoom tab showing. Well, let me see. I see what you're saying, but it doesn't give me an option of the uh, second screen. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. I'm assuming everybody can see the uh, screen. Yeah, there. I can yeah. see it. That's good. So we, we talked about uh, determining the validity of uh, syllogisms. And we talked about counterexamples, but counterexample is not really useful when the, the uh, syllogism is a, is a valid syllogism. And then keep in mind, valid doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's uh, the form is in the right, it's in the right form. So this other method uh, 
involves the use of rules. And uh, these rules involve the uh, definition of you know, our understanding of distributed terms. So we need to know what we mean by distributed terms. So the terms in a, a syllogism are either distributed or undistributed. And when we say that a term is distributed, it means it, uh, you can think of it as being spread out to all the uh, members of that category. So when we say all or none, we're saying it's distributed, it applies to everything in that category. And of course, uh, if it's undistributed, it means it doesn't refer to everything in that category. So whether a term is distributed or not is a term determined by its placement in a categorical statement. And then we'll examine each categorical statement in turn. You remember there's, yeah, you, if you again refer to the square of opposition, you got four corners, A, E, I, and O. So the uh, A is all S or P. So here S is distributed and P is undistributed. And the, the S refers to all of its class. We might think, well, if that's the case, why doesn't P refer to all of its class? Because P may be a larger class than S. And S, S may be just a subclass, but all of S are part of the, the uh, P class. So the statement all dogs are mammals says something about all members of the subject, the S class, that is all dogs. All dogs, every last one of them, is a mammal. Uh, but it doesn't refer to all members of its predicate class. That's uh, mammals, you know, cats are mammals, horses are mammals, cows are mammals. But they're not dogs. So mammals is a much larger, larger category than dogs. So uh, when you say all dogs are mammals, you're only referring to a small portion of mammals, but you're referring to all dogs. Dogs are distributed, mammals undistributed. And we go down to no S or P. Uh, here, uh, both S and P are distributed. And remember that that's an E statement. <clears throat> uh, the S refers to all of its class, and so does P. So the statement, no dogs or cats, makes a claim about dogs. They're not, not cats. It also makes a claim about cats. They're not dogs. So on that basis, it's distributed, referring to every single one in that class, in each class. Then we go down to the uh, I statement, sum S or P. So both S and P are undistributed. We're just talking about a portion of S. And if only some S or P, some S are outside of P. So you can't be referring to all of P either. Uh, no claim has been made about every S or every P. We're just saying that some S are not in the category P. Not saying what the rest of P is. is. And we're not saying what the rest of the S is. So it only says that some of the S are P and that some of the P are S. So we go down to the uh, O statement. Some S are not P. So S is undistributed and P is distributed. Remember, undistributed means is referring just a part of the class or the category. And distributed is referring to all of the category. So let's consider the whole statement. Some astronauts 
are not men. <clears throat> this uh, statement says nothing about all astronauts. You know, we even had some astronauts that were uh, chimpanzees at one time. So some astronauts are not men. Of course, some astronauts are women. So we're just talking about a portion of the uh, astronauts. And uh, some portion of them um, are not men. So it does make a claim about all men. Some of them are astronauts. You take the whole category of men, and some of them are astronauts. So that means men are distributed, and astronauts is undistributed. Uh, you know, in the um, you know when you make a, cl a claim about men, those that are not astronauts, they, they can be women, or as I said, as I said before, chimpanzees. So another way of saying this is that of uh, the entire universe of men, some are not uh, not astronauts. It may help to remember that the uh, subjects of universal statements are distributed by uh, definition of universal. And the predicates of negative statements are also distributed. And the rules for testing a syllogism are covered in the next lesson. That's when we get to uh, rules. So let's look at uh, testing syllogism by rules. So there are five rules for testing the validity of syllogisms. If any of the rules are violated, then a syllogism is invalid. If the syllogism passes all five, then it is a valid syllogism. And the rules are as follows. In at least one premise, the middle term must be distributed, must refer to everything in that category. And remember, the middle term is the one that is not in the conclusion. If a term is distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in the premise. And again, the middle term is not in the uh, conclusion. So that means either the major or the, the uh, minor terms uh, must be distributed. If it is distributed, it must uh, be in the uh, conclusion as a distributed term. A valid syllogism cannot have two negative premises, but it can have two affirmative premises or a, a negative and a, an affirmative premise. Just can't have two negative premises. A valid a syllogism cannot have a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. Uh, if you have an affirmative conclusion, then both the premises must be affirmative or else the uh, conclusion must be negative. And a valid uh, syllogism cannot have two different affirmative premises and a negative uh, conclusion. It can have either an affirmative conclusion or a negative premise or an affirmative premise or two affirmative premises. And if you compare, compare the last three uh, rules here, so the implication of rule three and five is that if the conclusion is negative, then one premise must be affirmative. You can't have two negatives, two negative premises. One premise must be affirmative and the other negative. If one, any one of the premises is a negative, then the conclusion must be negative. From rules uh, four and five, we see that if a syllogism has an affirmative conclusion, then it must have two affirmative premises. So these last three rules can be combined uh, into a more comprehensive rule. 
the number of negative conclusions in a syllogism must be equal to the number of negative premises. And that's why you can't have uh, two negative premises because you only have one conclusion. If a syllogism has no negative conclusion, um, that is, it only has an affirmative conclusion, then it must have not have a negative um, premise. You got zero negative in the uh, conclusion. You must have zero negative in the premises. If it has one negative conclusion, then it must have exactly one negative premise. So let's let's look at a uh, more in depth uh, discussion of each rule. So in rule one, in at least one premise, the middle term must be distributed. It means it must refer to everything in that category. So you got the, you know, we're talking about S and P. Um, so the middle term must either be the subject of an A statement. All this is P. Remember the, the four corners of the, the uh, square of opposition. So the middle term must be either be the subject of an A statement. All this is P. Uh, the subject or predicate of an E statement. No, e, no S is P. Or the predicate of an O statement. Some S is not P. And we look below here, and here's a paradigm showing which uh, terms are distributed or undistributed in categorical statements. You got A, E, I, and O statements. A statement, uh, the, the S must be uh, distributed, P, undistributed. E statements, both must be distributed. I statement, both can be uh, negative. Uh, and O statement, uh, both can be negative. So in examining uh, syllogism, uh, the first rule is applied by looking at what types of statements the middle term is in. Let's consider the uh, following syllogism. All men are mortals. Uh, no mortals are angels. Therefore, some angels are not men. The middle term is mortals. It kind of ties them together, uh, ties the premises together, but it's not in the conclusion. The middle term occurs in two types of statements. A statement, all S or P, and the E statement, no S or P. The middle term is not distributed in the A statement because it is, it is the predicate. There could be other things that are mortal. It is, distri it is distributed in the E statement because both, both terms are distributed in an E statement. None of a category includes everything in this category and also the category to which it refers. If you have none, you can't have none hidden anywhere. The syllogism therefore passes its first test. When this rule is broken, it is known as the fallacy of the undistributed middle. Uh, here's an example in which this fallacy is, is uh, made. All men are created beings, some created beings are angels. Therefore, some angels are men. The middle term created beings is not distributed in either premise. And that makes the uh, syllogism invalid. It, uh, the syllogism has an undistributed middle term. The reasoning behind this is, uh, rule is middle term connects the two premises. If the middle term is undistributed in both, meaning that in neither premise does it refer to all of its members, 
then no necessary connection is being made between the premises in the example uh, that we have here, the created beings of the major premise is a separate class from the created beings of the minor premise. So the only way a connection is necessarily made uh, between the two premises is for the middle term to be distributed and at least one of them, and it's not. So rule two, if a term is distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in its premise. And of course, you don't have the middle term in the conclusion. This rule is a result uh, of the more general rule that in a valid syllogism, the conclusion cannot go beyond the premises. It must uh, naturally flow from the premises. So if a term in the conclusion refers to all members of a particular class, that is, uh, the term is distributed, then the term in its premise must refer to all members of its class. This uh, rule can be uh, illustrated by looking again at the first example under rule one. Then let's look at it again there. The conclusion is a O statement. Some angels are uh, men. Uh, I think I should have had some angels not me in there. But anyway, the conclusion is a no statement, some are not P statement. But looking at the paradigm, we see that the predicate of a no statement is distributed. And let's look at the uh, paradigm again. O statement. Uh, Is here undistributed. Uh, we have a typo here. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, there's no connection between these uh, premises. Middle term doesn't connect them together. So the created beings of the, uh, um, we'll go down here. Looking at the paradigm, we see that the predicate of the O uh, statement is uh, distributed here. The O statement is distributed. That term there uh, must be distributed in the, the premise where it occurs. That happens to be the major premise. Men is, all men is distributed, and this is undistributed. They, they, mo they must both be uh, distributed and they're not. When it, uh, when this rule is broken, it can have one of the two names. Uh, if the major term is distributed in the conclusion, and look at here, all men that's distributed are men is not referring to the whole class of men. Some angels are men. It's not saying anything about the other men. So that's undistributed. They must both be distributed and they're not. So when this rule is broken, it can have uh, two names. If the major term is distributed in the conclusion and it's not, uh, but it's not distributed in, in the premise, and it is. It's known as the fallacy of, of an illicit major. Particularly if the minor term is distributed in, in the conclusion, but not in the premise, is, it is known as the fallacy of the illicit minor. So here's an example of a, an illicit major. Some rocks are granite, no granite is sandstone, and granite is your middle term. 
some is undistributed. And so some sandstones are not rocks. You take the whole category of rocks and that's distributed. But here it's undistributed. And uh, whatever is used here has got to be the same up here. The major term rocks is distributed in the inclusion, but not in the premise. Therefore, it's in, invalid. When you say not rocks, if it looks like a rock, then it's a not rock. Then some rocks you can ignore. You just look at the uh, rocks in the uh, in a bed of gravel, but you don't look at, at rocks anywhere else. So that's undistributed. Rule three, a valid syllogism cannot have two negative premises. So any syllogism that has only uh, E or O statements, that is no S is P or some S or not P, those are two negatives, as premises is invalid, both S and uh, O are negative statements. The uh, uh, or I should say both S, both uh, E and O are negative statements. The following combinations of uh, premises are therefore invalid. OO, that's bo both negative. OE, that's both negative. EO, that's both negative. And EE, both negative. One of the premises must uh, affirm something. If they're both uh, negations, then no valid con uh, conclusion can be drawn. We can look at this uh, example. Some Turks are not Muslims, no Hindus are Muslims. Therefore, some Hindus are not Turks. Well, each statement uh, can be true. There's some Turks that are not Muslims, and there are no Hindus that are Muslim because they're Hindu, different religions. Therefore, some Hindus are not Turks. Well, you can't say that. Don't know that to be true. So, but this uh, syllogism violates the uh, above rule. There's nothing affirmed. You're not saying anything that Turks are. You're not saying anything that uh, Muslims are. You're not saying anything that Hindus are. You know, not affirming anything, you're just saying what they're not. So the premises are O and E statements, respectively. Therefore, both are negative. If this rule is broken, and it is here, it is called the fallacy of two negative premises. Rule four. A valid syllogism cannot have a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. The first step in analyzing this rule is to determine the nature of the conclusion. If it is affirmative A, which is all is something, uh, or I is uh, some or some or not or something then it can have a, cannot have an E statement, no S or P, or O statement, some S or not P. You cannot have that in the premises. <clears throat> you look at the uh, sort of the same uh, syllogism as above, all Turks are Muslims, no Hindus are Muslims, therefore some Hindus are Turks. You got uh, all Turks are Muslim, you're affirming something. But you say no Hindus are Muslims. And, but to do that, you have to have a negative conclusion. <clears throat> you could say uh, no uh, Turks are uh, Hindus, because all Turks are Muslims, so no Turks. Uh, no uh, Turks are Hindus. <clears throat> uh, 
You see that all Turks? Every last Turk, every last one of them is a Muslim. And you're saying here, no Hindus. That's distributed, that's distributed. No Hindus, every last one of them, are, are not, a, not a one of them are Muslims. Muslims, your middle term. So you say, some Hindus are Turks. Well, you can see this, this can't follow from the uh, premises here because all Turks are uh, Muslim, so you can't have any of them that are Hindus because no Hindus are Muslims. So this rule uh, breaks rule four. The conclusion is an affirmative and I statement, some S or P. And the minor, minor premise is a negative, an E statement, uh, no S or P. So in testing the syllogism with this rule, uh, look first at the conclusion. If it is an affirmative, examine the premises and determine if either is a negative. If one is, then the syllogism is necessarily invalid. So any syllogism that breaks this rule may be said to commit the fallacy of a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. And we'll get through this one quickly. I know we're over time. Rule five, a valid syllogism cannot have two affirmative premises and a negative conclusion. You, you, you know, you test with this rule similar to testing with rule four. If the conclusion is negative, then one of the premises must also be negative. For example, all whales are mammals, no canaries are mammals. Therefore, some canaries are not whales. The conclusion is negative, therefore, one of the premises must be negative, which the minor premise is. The rule is not uh, broken. Remember, when we say some of something, we're not saying anything about the rest of them. In this case, no canaries are, uh, all canaries are not whales, but we can say, truthfully, some of them are not whales. So here's an example that breaks this rule. All whales are sea creatures. Some creatures are warm-blooded warm animals. Therefore, no warm-blooded animals are whales. <clears throat> you got a negative uh, conclusion that you must have a negative. Uh, one of the premises must be negative. So when you violate this rule, it can be called the fallacy of two affirmative premises and a negative conclusion. Uh, well, I said we we're over time. We, we still have a little more time. Let's, let's just continue right on then. Let's uh, look at uh, some of the statements, uh, some of the uh, previous lessons. We uh, went over uh, exercise and statements, or uh, statements, and we uh, went over some uh, statements as to what they are. You know, you can have true statements, false statements, questions, commands, nonsense, and so forth. So let's just look at these and and make a determination uh, as to what the what you are. You, you may not have printed these out, but if you have, it's all well and good. I'll make this a little larger. So let's just... Uh, commiserate here and just say what what are these are they true false question command and remember question and command are not statements you know you can have nonsense that's not a statement so jesus healed blind men well we know that he did yeah so he, some it's one of the miracles he did he healed some uh, blind men so that is a, that's a true statement. Well, King David was the first king of Israel. Well, we know that's not true because uh, uh, Saul was the first king of Israel. So that's a false statement. So uh, another one, the tongues as a fire at Pentecost were water. 
Well, you go back to that passage and it says nothing about water. It says there were tongues as a fire above the heads of those at Pentecost. So that's a false statement. Who wrote the book of Romans? It's not making a statement about anything. It's asking a question. Children, obey your parents. It's not making a statement about anything either. And it's not asking a question. And it does make sense. So it has to be a command. The Bible is the word of God. And we, when we talk about the Bible, we're talking about the uh, book that has the 66 chapters, in, 66 books in it, beginning with uh, Genesis and ending with Revelation. And that's what we're talking about, the Bible. And we know that to be the word of God. So that is a true statement. The Great the Pyramid of Giza is six feet high. Well, we've read enough about the uh, pyramid of the Great Pyramid of Giza to know that it is much higher than six feet, six hundred feet maybe. So that's a false statement. So number eight, who said slaves should obey their masters? Well, that's asking a question, so it's not a statement. How old was Jesus when he was baptized? Again, <clears throat> we're not uh, giving any information, making a statement, which gives us information. So we're asking a question. We're trying to obtain information. Number 10, they slily towed the gyre and gimbal. Yes, somebody email me and tell me what that means. Uh, it's not asking a question. It's not making a statement. It's not making a statement that can't be true or false. Uh, it's not commanding anything. It's just nonsense. The words, except for the the and the did, the and, don't mean anything. Just nonsense. So number 11, believe the good news. That, uh, you know, it could, uh, might say you ought to believe the good news or will you believe the good news or, but it's not saying that believe is, uh, is a command. You believe the good news. So that's command. Then number 12, the United States has 50 states. And we know that to be true. So that is a true statement. And that brings up a, a kind of a funny point that uh, somebody was trying to sell a World War I American flag on eBay. And, uh, but I counted the stars on the flag and had 50 stars on it, but it's a World War I flag or so they claimed. And I said, there cannot be a World War I flag. Of course, at that time, the United States was only 48 states. But that's just an aside, interesting deal. So we'll uh, conclude here. We're almost uh, at the end of time. So we'll conclude. You know, we won't be able to get through another lesson anyway. So we'll conclude here and pick up next week.